England Sustainability Series. My name is Meg Gray. I'm the Science and Technology Librarian here at BPL, and I'm one of the co-organizers with Jessica Burton of Southern Maine Conservation Collaborative, um, who works on this series. And we're really excited to see all of you today. Um, just a couple of quick announcements. April 24th is our next event. We meet here the fourth Wednesday of the month at 5.30. And in April, we're sort of continuing the theme, Wild Bees Super Pollinators with Deborah Perkins. And that's in um, conjunction with the Biodiversity Research Institute. They're working um, with our program manager. And they're going to have a show in the gallery next month. So I invite you to all come back and see that. It's called A Critical Balance. And then in May, it's our last event before our summer recess, we have John Hagen of Menomet, and he's going to be presenting When Science Doesn't Matter. So hope to see you then. And Jess is going to introduce our speaker tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Meg. Um, the Southern Maine Conservation Collaborative is a um, group of land and water conservation organizations who are committed to working together to figure out bigger impact solutions. And one of the things that I do is look for opportunities to broaden the conversation of conservation. And working with the library allows me to do that in many creative ways. So this is definitely one of my favorite, um, but one of the favorite parts of my job. I'm thrilled to be here. We have topics ranging all, all over the globe related to sustainability, because everything really does relate to sustainability. And tonight we're thrilled to have Heather McCargo here from the Wild Seed Project. And I'm going to read her bio because it's an amazing bio. So um, here we go. She is the executive director of Wild Seed Project, is an educator with 30 years of expertise in plant propagation, <coughs> landscape design, and conservation. She was the head plant propagator at the New England Wildflower Society's Garden in the Woods during the 1990s worked in landscape architecture, planning firms, specializing in ecological design, and has been a contributor to several research projects with USAID, the National Gardening Association, and MOFCA. She has lectured nationally and is widely published in journals and magazines, such as Horticulture and American Nurserymen. More locally, Heather designed the master plan for the medicinal gardens at Avena Botanicals in Rockland, and in 2014, founded Wild Seed Project, a nonprofit organization. She has a BA in plant ecology from New Hampshire College and an MA from the Conway School of Landscape Design. So I am thrilled to hear from Heather this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Thank you. Well, I'm thrilled to be here tonight. I've heard many speakers here, so it's fun to get to share my story with Wild Seed Project. What I'm going to do tonight is I want you to go away with the understanding of three things. The first is that our native plants are beautiful and they're deserving of a place in your landscape. The second is that native wild plants are different than domesticated plants and they're crucial to our region's ecosystem function. And then finally, we gardeners and landscapers can play a role in supporting the genetic diversity of our native plants. So after I cover all that, then I'll tell you a little bit about Wild Seed Project. And I'll speak for about an hour, and then we can have questions and answers. So first, I'm going to begin with beauty. We have so many beautiful native plants that can be used instead of exotic plants in our home landscapes and in commercial properties. In sunny, dry sites, instead of Rigosa rose or daylily, the common solution, we've got lots of species from dry, sandy, rocky habitats that will thrive in these conditions without needing extra water or amending. So in this picture, you're looking at um, aronia or black chokeberry on the upper left, upper right is butterfly milkweed. You know, we've got four native species of milkweed in Maine, and butterfly milkweed is the one from the sandy dry soils, but also hosts the monarch butterfly. The lower left is one of our wild rose species, and the bottom right is black eyed coneflower. You know, wet areas 
and low spots and drainage ditches. These are not a problem to be fixed and drained away. Instead, we've got from our native flora lots of species that thrive in fluctuating water levels from when it's flooded in the spring to even quite dry in the summer. So in this picture, you're looking at um, blue vervain on the upper left, the wild iris on the upper right, the, another one of our milkweed species. This is called the swamp or rose milkweed on the lower right. And then on the lower left is pussy willow. Pussy willow, by the way, is one of the most important host plant for butterfly and moth species. Um, so, and, the, and also the swamp milkweed is a great garden plant. Unlike the common milkweed, which you know, sends out runners underground and covers a big area, the orange milkweed and the swamp milkweed make great garden plants. In shady sites, you know, we have other solutions besides hostas and mulch. So, you know, in, you know, and God knows in Portland, there's lots of areas where mulch seems to be the landscape default. So in big areas where you want vigorous plants that can cover a lot of, air, a lot of space, um, we've got purple flowering raspberries, the shrub on the upper left. On the, the three pictures on the right are Canada anemone, large leaf wood aster, and New York fern. And those are three woodland ground covers. And I use the word ground cover to describe plants that spread and grow vigorously from their root system. And you know, we, they're perfect for pulling out where you pulled out invasive species. We need aggressive species to fill in or when you have big low maintenance area. So those are um, a nice choice for that. And you can plant all three together and let them weave together and make sort of a tapestry and getting away from this you know, just planting one species as a ground cover. Then we've got lots of other native plants from the, you know, woodland understory. You know, we live in the great eastern deciduous forest bioregion. We have hundreds of wonderful species that thrive in the shade. You know, shade is not a problem. And so in this picture, you're looking at bloodroot, one of the first wildflowers to bloom in the spring. That's the upper left. The upper right is red columbine, one of the early food sources for hummingbirds. The lower left is golden groundsel, and the lower right is wild geranium. And again, many more species. And if you want to learn more about all these species, that information is on the Wild Seed Project website. Um, acid soils under spruce, fir, or pine trees, people often think either they end up liming the other to area to make the soil more neutral or think nothing will grow. Well, we do have a lot of species that will do well in that. So on the upper right, you're looking at wild strawberry. That's an excellent native ground cover. That's both beautiful, edible, great pollinator plant. You can even make an herb tea out of the leaves. The upper right is bunchberry. Um, you know, one of the classic wildflowers of the boreal forest. It's actually a plant that grows all around the northern hemisphere, including in Europe and um, all throughout the Soviet Union. You know, it's a circumboreal plant. And with a warming climate, that species will be moving north. Um, so even Maine will eventually be too hot for it. But for now, it's a great, easy to grow um, ground, native wildflower. The lower left, is the Canada Mayflower. That's one of our little woodland lily species. It's a little maybe four inch tall bright green leaves and then it has these little white flower clusters that turn to red berries that are important for birds and other wildlife. And then the lower right is lowbush blueberry um, and it's mixed in with rock phlox. So rock phlox is a um, sort of a rocky ledge wildflower. It doesn't grow wild in Maine. Its, its natural range was sort of New York State um, is how far northeast it came, but it's perfectly hardy here. And it thrives in the you know, pure sand or gravel and does really well mixed in with lowbush blueberry. In fact, that picture is taken in a graveyard where the soil was very sandy and it even gets mowed over. And then we've got so many beautiful native um, trees and shrubs, so, you know, from small flowering trees, like this is a pagoda dogwood. Um, we have several native dogwood um, small trees. 
um, you know, Hawthorne's another one, spice bush, um, shad. We've got lots of small flowering trees. And then, of course, the native canopy trees are really important biodiversity trees for hosting a lot of wildlife and creating great shade. You know, oak, beech, maple. And particularly our native flowering shrubs all produce fruits in the late summer and fall that are really important for migrating songbirds. So in this picture on the left, you're looking at nannyberry viburnum. Then the middle one's highbush cranberry, and the far right is silky dogwood. There's a dozen shrub dogwood and viburnums that are all beautiful landscape shrubs. And when they bloom, they attract a lot of pollinating insects. And then their fruits you know, are great you know, for the migrating songbirds, and they're beautiful. We even have native species of rhododendrons and azaleas. This is the, lar you know, the Great Bay rhododendron, or large leaf rhododendron. This is a species that ranges from Georgia all the way up to New England. The northernmost wild population in Maine is actually down in Alfred, Maine. Um, it's a sanctuary owned by the New England Wildflower Society. There's a couple hundred plants there. Um, it's like a remnant population with development um, all around it. And so that's you know, the classic evergreen rhododendron. And if you go to a garden center, mostly they sell exotic species or hybrids between North American species and the Asian species. And then you don't get the support of the pollinators. You can see, the, I know the picture's not quite in focus, but there's a bumblebee on the rhododendron. This is actually the last of the rhododendrons to bloom, so it's mid-July when it blooms. And 150 years ago, the, a lot of these were dug from southern Maine and put in estates on Mount Desert Island and around Camden and all up and down the coast of Maine. So just a classic rhododendron. We also have three native azalea species. And then there's quite a f few more rhododendron and azaleas that are not, don't grow wild in Maine, are from a little farther south than us, but are perfectly hardy here. So lots to choose from. We even have native spireas. This is steeplebush spirea, spirea tomentosa. We also have a white species. You know, these are incredible butterfly um, plants when they bloom in the summer. And the seeds are great bird food in the fall and winter. And there's even a native hydrangea. So this is hydrangea arborescens. It's, it's a southern New England native, but it's perfectly hardy here. Some of you may have this in your garden, but you probably have a cultivar of it called Annabelle that has a big double white flower. That was a you know, mutant form of this. And so what happens with a double flower is that the stamens and pistils mutate and they look like petals. So when you look at these flowers, you see kind of a ring of bigger um, flowers on the outside and then the cluster of little ones in the middle. So it's the little ones that are actually um, where the seeds are formed. The outer ring are just sort of an indicator for the pollinators to come. This plant is covered with pollinators when it's in bloom. And I've seen, um, there's a place in Camden where somebody has the cultivar, the Annabelle double flowered one, right next to the species. And you'll see the bee go into the double one and keep going in and coming out because there's nothing for it. You know, what's happened is those sex organs of the plants have mutated, and so there's no pollen, there's no um, nectar, it just is all petals. So we have our own, we, and there's even a southern, um, another species of hydrangea native farther south too. So we have our own hydrangea species from the eastern deciduous forest that support all the other wildlife and are beautiful. Now, I can't give you a blue hydrangea. We do not have that in our flora. However, we have lots of beautiful wildflowers that are blue. Um, and so you can still get your blue fix. So in this picture, you're looking at, starting on the upper left, that's the blue wood phlox. Upper right is Jacob's Ladder. Lower left is bottle gentian, and lower right is blue lobelia. Um, those are four woodland species. Um, here's a couple more, the blue iris. The upper right is our true native lupin, the sundial lupin. It's actually extinct in Maine. 
hasn't been seen in about um, 50 years in Maine. It was never common here. It grows, the lupin that you see all over the place in Maine is actually from the Pacific Northwest. It is not a native species, and it's from the other half of our continent, so it's completely out of our bioregion. That plant loves our cold, damp soils. Well, the true native lupin was a plant of sandy, gravelly, kind of piney open forest. So it was never real abundant in Maine, and where it probably grew was like in the Kennebunk Plains, Wells, that area. There's still a big population of it in the Pine Barrens in New Hampshire near Concord. In the rest of New England, it's you know extremely rare plant, maybe known from only one or two populations. Then as you get out to the prairie states, it's much more common. Um, but it used to be a really wide-ranging species, and it's really easy to grow from seed and plant in your garden. The lower left is the Scotch bellflower. It is an American plant. Um, that's a plant of rocky ledges and cliff sides. And then the lower right is the smooth blue aster, and we have quite a few asters with a lovely bluish color. So I can't give you a blue hydrangea with the native species, but there's plenty of blue from our flora. So, you know, anyone can substitute a native plant for an exotics in their gardens. And you can just add one species. You can do a whole garden of natives. Um, in this little garden, this is my garden. That's a pagoda dogwood. And there's ferns and Solomon seal and Jacob's ladder and shooting star. You can just add one species. This is a Wild Seed Project member. She planted a row of... Um, of New England aster that she'd grown from seed along her fence on the road. And in October, it is covered with bumblebees and the monarch butterflies fueling up for their flight south. You know, or if you live in an apartment or condominium and don't have any earth to call your own, you can put natives in pods, you can put them in the hell strip. You know, everybody, this is something that everybody can do. But the real reason to plant natives is because we want to create landscapes that are resilient and that are part of natural cycles instead of obstacles to them. This photo is from over near the Four River on the north side of Portland. And right along the edge of the river, there in the woods, there are remnant populations of a lot of the really slow-growing woodland wildflowers like um, there's trillium, there's trout lily, there's wild ginger, there's um, trout lily, lots of ferns, there's witch hazel in the understory. You know, all those plants are uh, indicative of forests that has never been plowed or grazed. Those slow-growing woodland wildflowers, once they're wiped out of the woodland understory, they don't come back very easily. A lot of them, the seeds are dispersed by ants, so they're not getting eaten by a bird and flown to a new site. So in, within Evergreen Cemetery is another site in Portland where there's remnant populations of woodland wildflowers. But yet all these sites are now isolated, and we have encroached on them. So isolated pockets of nature you know, are being pecked at from the edge, both from our development where we're building buildings and paving, and even where we're leaving the soil and planting in it, we're replacing what was once there with species from another part of the world. And so we are slowly pushing back the natural areas, and small populations over time suffer from inbreeding and, you know, lose resiliency. The other way we're really affecting you know, natural areas or landscapes that could support a lot of nature is with our mowing practices. We are mowing nature away, you know, all of our open areas. Mowing in mid-season is the equivalent of a clear cut to all those meadow species. Now, if you need a lawn, you know, there's no other plant that you can walk on and treat like a rug. But we don't need the vast areas of lawn. This is a cemetery in the Western Prom. And cemeteries are really interesting places botanically because they were always put on sandy, well-drained soil so you could bury people and not have them rot away. Um, and they weren't plowed or, you know, they might have had grazing animals, but they weren't plowed. So there's often a lot of interesting wildflowers in there. So in this one, in May, there'll be wild strawberry, bluets, blue-eyed grass, hawkweed, 
you know, violet, sand violet, lots of little wildflowers blooming. And then what happens? They come in and mow it right in the height of bloom. And you know, most of those species are perennial, so they can handle being mowed once in a while, but you're interrupting their reproduction and they don't you know, get to set seed. You know, so mid-season mowing of a meadow, you know, this habit that we have gotten into as a culture of mowing our meadows in the middle of the growing season, you know, it probably stemmed from when people needed to harvest hay, and if you are harvesting hay, you need to do it in the middle of the growing season. But otherwise, wait until late fall or even early spring. You know, all the aster seeds, they are not ripened and being dispersed till well into November. So when you let maybe the wildflowers bloom and then you mow right after it, you're preventing the reproduction from happening. We can't do nothing anymore though. Like I get a lot of people coming saying to me, oh, I have some land, I'm, I just don't wanna touch it. I wanna let nature be. And we unfortunately are, can't do that anymore. And the reason is that we have mixed up the world's flora and fauna and we have you know, unwittingly introduced some species that are you know, aggressive invaders. And by invasive, I mean they displace everything else that is there. And so we always, in a meadow or any landscape, we're all gonna have to learn to identify those plants which do cause a problem and displace everything else and pull them out. But, you know, the other thing is everybody's barometer of what nature is supposed to look like has moved, you know, lower and lower. And I find most people don't really know what a healthy piece of, of forest or, you know, natural habitat should look like. And so I really encourage you to get out and find places, you know, that are, you know, conservation land. This is actually the Rachel Carson Reserve in Wells has a beautiful piece of woodland there where you can really see what a healthy, diverse forest, you know, mature forest looks like, which is a canopy, layers of vegetation, and then a real diversity of flora on the understory. You know, get out there and learn what that looks like. And protect it. If, if you see land nearing you that's, you know, a, you know, a nice natural area, get involved in helping to protect it. Now I'm going to just describe a little bit what I think the word native means, because it's a very loaded word to a lot of people. And this is a picture from the Camden Hills. And, you know, 12,000 years ago, the glaciers had finally retreated out of the coast of Maine. And if you were looking at this view, you would have seen nothing but rock and gravel. Um, there would have been no plants. All of the flora, all of our flora has been pushed north and south, you know, at least half a dozen times in the last two million years. Our eastern flora is many millions of years old and has gone through a lot of climactic changes. And, and so if you, in Maine we have about 1,600 native species. We have another 700 exotic species living here that live wild here. So we have a flora of about 2,100 wild plants, about two-thirds of which are native. You know, the rest are recent imports from uh, other parts of the country. If you go down to Massachusetts, there are 4,000 native species. You go down to Vid Virginia, there are 7,000. You know, the farther south you go, the more diversity there is because, you know, when the glaciers pushed everything out, all the plants had to migrate to the south. And they could migrate to the south more quickly than plants can migrate to the north. And, you know, if you think about it, the, a lot of the seeds ripen in the summer and fall, so the birds eat them and fly south. So our flora could move, when the ice age came, could move more quickly than it will be able to move north because the birds are taking the seeds in the wrong direction um, for a warming climate. Um, so, the, you know, so when scientists use the word native, they mean usually the plants that were here pre-Columbus. And that's, that point in time is picked just because once that post-contact happened, that's when we really started mixing up the world's flora. But in that 500 years since then, plants would have naturally been migrating. You know, the climate's been getting warmer. And so that still only represents a snapshot in time. So, I want to explain to you what the difference is between a wild plant and a, 
you know, domesticated plants. So this is New England aster, one of our beautiful native wildflowers. And flowers are a plant's mean of sexual reproduction. And the way a flower looks has evolved to attract the pollinators because plants can't move around. Most plants have flowers that have both male and female sex organs. That's the stamens and pistils. Some plants have separate male and female flowers, but most have both sex organs, but they still are dependent on their pollen getting taken to another plant to mix up the gene pool. And so that's what a flower is all about. And those colors, that's all about attracting the insects to come pollinate it. Um, and then, if successful, those plants will produce seeds. And you know, most of our native plants, like our wildflowers, most of them are perennials. They're not annuals. So you know, if you think back to your school botany class, it was always that the seed is the beginning and the end of the life cycle of a plant. Well, that's only true of annuals. With perennials and trees, you know, the seeds represent their you know, chance of descendants in the future. But you know, an oak tree, which will live a couple hundred years, will produce millions of seeds in its lifetime. And for that plant to be reproductively successful, only one of those seeds has to land somewhere and grow to adulthood. But it's that mixing up of the genes that the insects do the primary job of mixing up the genes that creates the genetic diversity in those seeds. And then the other things that native, our native flora do is our plants have co-evolved with the insects and birds and other wildlife for millions of years so that they're dependent on each other. And so people have gotten the message with monarch butterfly that it has to have milkweed plant. Well, that's not some freak, unusual relationship in nature. All of our native plants have other insects and other creatures that need them for part of their life cycle. And particularly the butterflies and moths, they, the, in their caterpillar stage, they need our native plants to lay their eggs and for then those caterpillars to then eat and grow to maturity. And those caterpillars are one of the biggest food sources for birds. So plants are sort of the base of the food web. They then get insects and then other animals eating them and that's how the food web is all tied together. The other way native wild plants are different from our garden plants is that there's no such thing as a monoculture in nature. You know, n you never see a native plant growing in a pure stand. So for instance, this is their blue iris. And just in this picture, there's several different species of grasses and sedges. There's violets down on the, f on the ground, and there's some of the white spirea there. There's just no such thing as a monoculture in nature. You know, that's one of the things that some of our invasive plants do is they grow in a pure stand and wipe everything else out. Well, that's not what happens in nature. And it's that, that m many different species growing together that create resiliency. Also, the nutrient needs of wild, undomesticated plants is really different from, if you're a good vegetable or flower gardener, you know, you're growing plants from another part of the world, they've been domesticated, they've gotten used to getting high nutrients and water, and you also then take a harvest away. Well, think of what happens in the forest every year. How are nutrients recycled there? You know, each fall, copious amount of leaves, branches, you know, dead insects, animal feces falls down to the forest floor where it, you know, then begins the process of decay. You know, all kind of insects and animals overwinter under that leaf litter. And then the fungi and the other microorganisms in the soil help break down those nutrients and then slowly release them to the plants the next year. You know, so it's a perfect cycle cyclical process where the nutrients will fall down and then they'll get taken up the next year. You know, so those are the processes that we need to mimic in our landscape. In our native plants, they don't need all this compost and fertilizer and extra water. If you have sited the plant properly and you know, taken some care during establishment, which is if your soil is really compacted, loosening it with a digging fork, but really, the only nutrients they need every year are the leaves that fall on the beds. Maybe if you don't have a lot of trees, you want to add a little composted bark or leaf mold. 
you know, we do not need to be over nutrient, you know, adding a lot of nutrients when you plant native plants. It's one of the things that makes gardening with them is so pleasurable. It's so many less inputs, once, especially once they're established. You know, once you have a dense carpet of plants covering the forest floor, not big patches of mulch, then the leaves will just, you know, get trapped between the twigs and plants and degrade and get caught in there and provide habitat. So I'm now going to move into talking about what's going on in the nursery trade with native plants. Because the modern nursery industry is very centralized, uses a lot of nasty chemicals, and it's really taken a turn of favoring cloned selections of plants instead of seed-grown plants. So the picture on the right is purple coneflower. If any of you have had herb gardens for decades, you've probably had you know, the wild type of purple coneflower in your garden. It's a prairie wildflower, Does it, it ranges east into New York State and western Pennsylvania. So more common in the prairie states, but a very tough perennial. In the wild, it's about two to four feet tall. The petals droop down. It can range in color from pale pink to deep pink. And it's an incredible pollinator magnet in the summer. All kind of bumblebees and butterflies are all over it. And then in the fall and winter, the birds peck the seeds out of it. Well, in the 90s, um, this plant won the Perennial Plant of the Year Award with the Perennial Plant Association. And since then, all kind of breeding has been going on with it. So there's about a dozen coneflower species native to the prairie states. And so they've been hybridizing them. So what happens when you hybridize two species is you mess up their sex organs. So people know how a horse and a donkey makes a mule that can't reproduce. Well, the same thing often happens with plants. When you hybridize two species, you, you, know, you make the sex organs. They don't match up with the mix of the genes of the two different species. So if you look in the picture on the left, in the upper left, you see the yellow one way up in the upper left-hand corner. So there's a, a yellow coneflower, and that's a, you're looking at hybrids between a bunch of different native species. So you can see the range of colors. There's even one in the middle where all the stamens and pistils have mutated and it looks like kind of a puffball. So that plant has no nectar or pollen. These are all being mass produced. Most of them um, in a nursery in Texas. A lot of them are um, patented. They're all produced in a, a laboratory and then grown out in huge greenhouses. A lot of nasty chemicals are using use. This is not what I think we want to have happen with our native plants. You know, and those plants are practically, they're not even hardy here anymore. Their resilience and toughness and drought tolerance has all been taken away. Um, and so that's what I don't want to see happen with our native plants because those don't attract the pollinators even though they're marketed at the nursery as you know, being great for pollinators. Most of them aren't. Um, and on top of it, you can't, uh, uh, nurseries can't propagate those on their own. They're required with these patented plants to get the original plant from the patent holder. Here are two of our native lobelia species. So cardinal flower, which is hummingbird pollinated, and the great blue lobelia on the left. These are both native in Maine. Cardinal flower is still pretty abundant on often on rivers and streams. The blue lobelia is actually a rare plant, although it's very easy to grow and widely available in the native nursery world. So, so if you go to a nursery and purchase cardinal flower, you'll see a lot of ones that will say lobelia, and then they might have an X and then a little name in quotes. And so that means it's a hybrid. It might be a hybrid between these two native species, or it could be a hybrid between the cardinal flower and the many tropical cardinal flowers. And again, when they've been crossed, it messes up the flower structure. And it doesn't, they don't, you know, some of them, the hummingbird goes to the, those cultivars of cardinal flower and they have either no nectar or a small percentage of it. There's a woman at the University of Vermont who's done extensive research on this. So the cultivars of the cardinal flower might offer 10% of the nectar. So the hummingbird's flitting around and having to work 10 times as hard just to get what it's after. Um, so again, this is what we don't want to have happen with our native plants, and these two plants are very easy to grow from seed. 
This is a shot in Portland of one of our, a cultivar of one of our native trees, red maple. And um, red maple is one of our most adaptable native trees in urban areas. It's very tolerant of salt and compacted soil. But most of what gets sold to get planted are clone cultivars. So if you look at the shape of this tree, it's got very vertical, upright branches. And if you look in a nursery catalog, it's marketed, you know, this is a great street tree because the branches won't hit the bus or it won't hit the building. They'll just grow upright and you won't ever have to prune it. Well, if anyone here has ever taken a pruning class, the first thing they teach you is that a narrow crotch in a branch. So that's where if the branch is going out very Horizontally, there's a lot of tissue, and that's a strong branch. Um, if it's a narrow crotch, there's very little tissue, and it's weak. That's why half these branches are dead. Um, so, and then the other thing is these are all clones. So here we've got a line of the same genetic individual. And if any of you have Irish ancestry, you know that's probably how you ended up here. Was a uh, the clonal potatoes that were planted all over Ireland. That was one individual that was planted in the whole country and when the disease came through, wiped it all out, you know, within a week. And so we're, here we've even, the, they've even planted a native tree, but they haven't planted a seed grown one that would be, each one would be genetically unique. And we really need that genetic diversity because we don't know, you know, we all know what the pathogens are that are getting us today, and they're all exotic, like, you know, the brown tail moth. You know, we are going to keep getting bombarded with exotic pests that our native plants are going to have to, you know, try to rise up and overcome. And some of them will if we've got big populations with a lot of genetic diversity. But if we've got the same gene pool all planted, there'll be no genetic diversity and they'll be all the more susceptible. This is um, bush honeysuckle. It's one of our great native shrubs. It's about three feet tall. And when it blooms, it has these little yellow flowers that bumblebees love. And after it's been pollinated, the flowers turn reddish. So you can see half of these have been pollinated and half haven't. And if you look at the edge of the leaf, you see that little purple color. Well, a lot of our native trees and shrubs, when they first leaf out in the spring, have kind of a reddish or purplish color to them. And that chemical is to deter herbivores. So it's to keep bunny, deer, and insects from nibbling on them in that first week when they unfurl because they've just gone through dormancy and they want to photosynthesize as much as they can. And then that color goes away and they're just green. Um, so here's another picture of that plant on the left when it's leafing out in the green with that coppery color. Well, if you go to a garden center, you'll see there's so, you know, there's a huge trend of picking out purple leafed forms of plants. And somebody has now found a purple leaf form, you know, one of these bush honeysuckles that stayed red all summer. You know, it's just a genetic mutant. And, and why we don't want to support that is, so just like the monarch butterfly caterpillars have to live on milkweed, this honeysuckle has five species of native moth that their caterpillars, this is the host plant for, and they won't eat that red color. So let's pretend somebody did that to milkweed. If they picked a purple leaf milkweed form, the monarch butterfly couldn't raise their young on it. This is not the direction we want to go with our native plant. Now the final way that native seeds are and, and how they germinate in the wild is different from cultivated plants in that is that they don't all germinate at once. So this is our native wild geranium. And when, when I sow a pot of them, let's say I sowed 100 seeds, which this pot probably has 100 seeds, that first you sow them outdoors in the fall, they germinate in the spring, about a third of those 100 seeds will germinate the first spring, and then the rest will germinate the second year. So the big leaves are the ones that germinated the year before, and the little ones are the ones that germinated last spring. This is a good strategy in a wild plant to not have all your seeds germinate at once. So if you think about the weather last year, so you know, let's say these geranium in the wild, the seeds that germinated in the wild last year, if you remember, it never rained in May or June. 
any of those seeds that germinated last year wouldn't have you know, made it past a couple of months. They would have shriveled up and died. So lots of wild plants, they have heavier seed coats and they don't germinate so quickly. You know, not, plenty of them will germinate at a higher rate than this in the first year, but that's still a typical strategy of a wild plant to not have uniform germination. And if you grow, you know, vegetables, you know on your package of lettuce seeds, it says, a, you know, germinate in seven days. And, you know, if they don't all germinate them, assume they're dead. That's just not true with native seeds. So before I talk about how you sow the native seeds and propagation, just briefly, I want to point out that not all wild plants make good garden plants. This is the pink lady slipper orchid. And so, this species has to have specific soil fungi for the seeds to germinate and for the plant to grow and live. And nobody has figured out how to mimic that in a nursery. Now, all of our native plants, all of our trees, shrubs, and wildflowers have associations with soil fungi. You know, that is common in nature. But some species have to have it. And this is one that has to have it. So this is a wildflower that doesn't belong in your garden. You see it for sale, it's been pillaged from the wild. Some of the other common wildflowers that are sold in the nursery trade that are not nursery propagated but have been dug, a lot of ferns, unfortunately, are dug from the wild. Bunchberry and lowbush blueberry sod, even though they're perfectly propagatable. Um, and, and then some of the slower growing woodland wildflowers like trillium. Um, you know, those take seven years from seed to reach blooming size. So, you know, for a nursery to be propagating that, they have to really know what they're doing and you should expect to pay a high price, um, which is, you know, $15. You're going to hold on to a plant for seven years before selling it. You should expect to pay a high price. So, what's the solution? The solution is seed-grown native plants. And this, you know, I studied propagation back in 1978. And my, you know, my, the classic book, Michael Durer's Reference Manu Manual to Woody Plant Propagation, he tells you how to grow every native and exotic um, tree and shrub from seed. And in the introduction to the book, though, he talks about the promise of tissue culture and cloning and how nurseries want all, you know, are so frustrated that all, when they plant out a row of trees, that they don't all look the same. And with cloning, we'll be able to get them all looking the same. So, that, so no awareness that we were going to lose all this genetic diversity. Well, now, mo so many nurse nurseries really aren't propagators anymore. Most of them, not all of them. They buy in plants from other parts of the country. And in fact, if they're, you know, a lot of the cultivars, you have no choice. You're not allowed to propagate them. But, you know, with the cultivars, and those are plants with the little name with a quote after that. That's where somebody either purposely bred or just selected an unusual form of a plant because they liked it better. And, you know, when there was plenty of nature around, it was fine that we, you know, could choose a plant and say, oh, this one looks pretty, let's just focus on this. But there's not a lot of place in the wild for our native plants to exist anymore. And so we really need to be growing them from seeds and encouraging nurseries to grow their plants from seeds. And so demanding that of our nurseries, they want to sell us plants, tell them you want seed grown ones, not the cultivars. And so one of the things Wild Seed Project does, we collect and sell the seeds of about 75 species of Maine wildflowers. The most important thing I want you to know is that the best time to sow the native seeds is in the late fall or early winter. There are species that you can sow in the spring, but think about where you live and what the winter's like. This is what our plants have evolved with. And so how you do that is, you know, what I like to do is get people to sow them in pots. Everyone wants to just toss their seeds out in their yard. And I'm like, yes, it's true in nature, the seeds blow around or the bird, you know, disperses it somewhere, but, you know, a very small percentage, 1% or left of those seeds land where they're going to germinate and grow. You sow the seeds in a prepared area, whether that's a little nursery bed, cold frame, you know, uncovered cold frame, or in pots. I like to get people to do it in four-inch pots. 
You can sow lots of seeds, you know, our native seeds. They're like teenagers, they all like to germinate together. So on the pot on the right, that's, that's milkweed. There's 50 milkweed seeds in there. The pot in the middle is New England aster. The one on the left is black-eyed coneflower. After you can do this Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year, you can do it inside. Then you cover the pots with sand, coarse sand, not with more potting soil. And when, peop when people fail with germ germinating seeds, there's usually two things that happened. Either they buried the seeds too deeply. Seeds need light to germinate. That's why when you rototill, suddenly you have all these new um, weeds germinating. You're bringing seeds that have been waiting to come to the surface. Um, so, so not burying them too deeply and using sand instead of potting soil. And then, or they, um, or they dry out, so not, you know, not letting the seed pot dry out while it's germinating. And again, it's an advantage of doing them outdoors. So after you've sown those, put the sand on them, you take them outside, so it can be, let's say it's January 1st, you can put them in the snow, if there's snow on the ground, you just need a flat, shady place. I like to put wire over them because there's a lot of squirrels around here and they're like the local juvenile delinquent and they'll pull your labels out. So put like rabbit wire over them and just leave them. And then in the spring, starting in late March, they will start, some species germinate when it's still regularly going down below freezing. Um, others wait till the heat of summer. So, in what, so with four inch pots, you can have 50 seedlings in four inch pots in one square foot. You can have hundreds of little native plants germinating. It's not hard to do. I then, I really recommend that people grow them on for the summer and then wait and plant them in their garden in the fall. And the reason is um, they don't grow as quickly as annuals. And unless you're incredibly attentive, once you get them out in the garden, you've got to, you know, check on them a couple times a week to make sure they're not getting overcrowded with weeds. So what I like to have people do is just take that four inch pot and put it in a much bigger pot and just grow it in your doorway for the summer, and then you can divide them up and plant them out in the fall. All of our native plants are really losing their place in our world. I still, I studied plant ecology in college, and I still have my Newcomb's Field Guide of the wildflowers, and when you read through an old version of it, they always list, you know, is the plant common, abundant, or rare? And I'm just always saddened when I go back and look at how many species used to be considered common that aren't anymore. You know, these plants really need us to give them space in our yard again, you know. And in reality, almost everything about the state of our nature is, you know, has deteriorated in the last 40 years, shockingly so. But what makes me really hopeful is more so than ever before, people really recognize that we need to change how we live with the rest of the species around us, and they want to do something. And planting natives is a really positive action you can do, whether you sow the seed yourself, whether you go you know, get some plants from a good nursery and plant them in your yard, whether you do one plant, 10, or your whole yard, you will right away start seeing the pollinators come back. These plants are really dynamic in the landscape in a way that the garden plants that we've gotten so used to aren't anymore. So I'm hopeful, you know, there are a lot of us. We can create change if we want to. You can all do something by going out there this year and learning what's in your backyard, protecting it if it's native, and figuring out where you can plant some more native plants. The, so I want to point out the Wild Seed Project, uh, the other thing we do is we have a, a very educational website with lots of free information. There's lots of blogs, which are just articles on some aspect of gardening with native plants. We've got lists of species for different growing conditions. You know, up on the table back there, you can see the seeds we have for sale. We have lot, just if you look through the seed sale, you can click on the picture of the plant, learn about where it grows in the wild, how it does in the garden. We also publish, have an annual magazine that's um, 
one of the benefits of membership, this is just, we just got it back from the printer today, and um, they're getting mailed out this week to our membership, so it's one of the benefits of membership. Um, or you can also, we sell it in some places around town, it'll be available probably at the end of next week. But this is filled with articles by, you know, I'm able to pull on my other colleagues in the native plant world and get them to tell their story and what, what they know, so lots of good how-to information. This issue has some good writing on how to remove invasive species without chemicals, you know, how vegetation might shift with climate change. Deb Sewell from Avena Botanicals wrote about cultivating native medicinal herbs. We got um, a Native American who's also a scientist up at UMaine. She wrote a lovely piece on her work with sweet grass and brown ash. Really good writing in here. So I'm happy to answer anyone's questions, either as a group or people want to come up afterwards. Yes? I just want to ask you if you could clarify what some native farm species are. Like, it, it, obviously, Japanese. Uh, Silver yes. Is no. Not yes. So that's what's shocking when you go to the nursery. They sell lots of native ones. So the, I have a whole blog on the website on native ferns. But the, they propagate the Japanese one and they buy the native ferns from people who dig them. You know, when you buy wild collected plants, you undercut any nursery who's trying to propagate. How can they compete when somebody's, you know, just getting these ones that they're digging for free. So, you know, Christmas fern, ostrich fern, cinnamon fern, there's a lot of native ferns. So you're saying to not pot Just ask them, yeah, it makes, yes, yes. Sometimes you can tell, you know, if there's, lo if there's lots of other plants in the pot with it, um, but it's unfortunately very calm. If they're selling blueberry sod or bunchberry sod as opposed to plants in pots, that's stripped from blueberry field. So, you know, not only does it bring in invasives when they remove the sod, but, you know, the blueberry fields are sprayed with some really nasty herbicides these days, and you're just going to be bringing that into your yard. Bunchberry is really easy to grow from seed. And the same thing with the astables, all that kind of fern family is the same situation? The, the stilby, no, stilbies are all Japanese, so they're propagating them. It's not that you can't propagate these, it's just, you know, Probably because Maine is such a rural state, there still seems to be a, little, a lot of land. People you know, think, oh, I can just go dig these. It's a big problem in um, like Kentucky, Tennessee. In fact, some what's sold here might come from down there. And it's illegal in other states. But in, in Maine, you know, the only plants that are protected are ones that are on, ranked on our endangered species list. So if they're not that, in, if they're not completely endangered, the state has no power to keep you from doing whatever you want. And even the endangered ones, you know, there's only like five people. Do you have to ask, is this, is this grown? Yes, yes, or the ferns, it's from spores. But you could say, where did you get them from? Are you sure they were nursery propagated? Because even on the tag, it says native. Yes. And then I see those quotes all the time. Yeah, yeah, yes. So yes. that's totally cultivar. Yes. Okay, thank you. Yes. Yeah. I have a question about um, bittersweet. Is there any native plant that will push that out? Well, we have a native bittersweet. When I was in college in Western Massachusetts, it was nine, that's all you saw, the native bittersweet. And in that time, the native bittersweet, I never see it anymore. It's rare. And we've just, it's completely been displaced with the Asian bittersweet. Um, so yes, yeah, some of these, I, so we've linked to some of the articles in this new issue, like the articles on invasives. There's a short list of natives to plant after you've pulled out invasives, and then I've created a much longer list, more comprehensive list, um, than we were able to fit in here. So that will all, you can find that information. There's lots of great, more, you know, natives that are more, the more aggressive growers. You cannot be native and be invasive. People say that to me all the time. They go, oh, you know. Um, yeah, no, it's a native species. It's not displacing what's supposed to be there. It might be aggressive. In fact, poison ivy, the reason it seems to be taken over everywhere is there's a certain percentage of plants that are growing faster with the increased CO2 in the atmosphere. 
And it's mostly the invasives and the poison ivy. Of all of our native plants, that was the one that it had to be. Um, you know, but it doesn't, keep other, it doesn't keep the forest from coming back. It doesn't stop that plant succession. It might be annoying, and you can pull poison ivy out. It's, you, know, you need to protect yourself with clothes. But it's not, it's not invasive. It's just annoying to people. So that's the real definition of it's not displacing others that you consider it native or OK. Well, there are plenty of exotic plants that are not invasive. You know, and, and the state publishes a list of the ones that are actually now banned to be sold, and then there's a whole another huge list of ones that are probable invasives. You know, the scary thing is that, so I studied plant ecology back in 78, and the, the invasive species situation has so exploded since then. And it is shocking, almost all the invasives were introduced by horticulture. So, it's, and you know, if you're a gardener and you love plants, there are so many beautiful native plants. You know, I'm not asking you to have a boring garden. People don't, you know, you don't see these plants out in the wild anymore. And, but there are lots that are beautiful that I promise will be just as exciting. And then, you know, if you have like the blue palm hum hydrangea, that one can't reproduce from seed. So if you really, you know, there's not, if it's not invasive and there's, there's some plant that, you know, your mother loved or something, you don't have to feel bad about that. But we do need to weigh up the percentage of natives on our property because if any of you know who the entomologist Doug Tallamy is, he wrote a book called Bringing Nature Home. And he has done all the research on natives and the wildlife they host, particularly the butterflies, moths, and birds. And, you know, birds feed their babies caterpillars. And, and his most recent research shows that a landscape that is less than 85% native species won't even be, uh, one mother chickadee won't be able to raise her four little chicks. There will not be enough caterpillars. So take in Portland all the Norway maples, which are both and a really invasive species, but the any of our native maples would host a lot of the caterpillars. They all get eaten up by the birds. It's not like you're going to end up with trees all gobbled up. It's the, it's the exotic pest moths that do that. And they're doing it worse because we don't have the birds anymore because we don't have enough of the vegetation that supports the insects that will make the bird life cycle happen. So we do need, we all need to add more natives to your landscape. And yes, please rip out if you've got any of the invasives. You know, get rid of them. But if you've got some garden plant, if you love your peony, peony isn't nat there. I haven't heard of any invasive peonies at this point, so you don't have to worry about that. Yeah. Hi. Um, I'm the close to deering oaks, mm -hmm. and I know that sometimes they designate areas, big areas, for not mowing, mm -hmm. which is a good idea. Yeah. I'm sure. Yeah. I'm just wondering if you could comment on how your notes and maybe other parks are taken care of with the city. Yes, yeah, so no, there's a big movement that they're stopping mowing, but what has to go hand in hand with that is walking through it a couple of times in the summer. And if there's any bittersweet or any invasives coming up, pulling them up, you know, getting them, you know, we're at the beginning where they're finally not mowing everything. But that's the time to be monitoring for the invasives. Because once you get a healthy, established meadow going, less invasive will be coming in. But you'll still always have to check. So I'm, I'm excited that they're doing that. But it needs to have the hand-in-hand -hand piece of walking through and make sure there's no swall black swallow ward is a real, not, there's a lot of that in the Western Prom Cemetery or bittersweet. Well, thank you, everybody. And please go take a look at the back table and go visit our website.